Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony, and I am an addict. And I have to say, there's electricity in this room tonight. I mean, touched, deeply touched. I don't know you, but I know you. Uh, when I came up to Wisconsin for the first time, WCNA 12, my life changed. I met the people from all over the country. There was only uh, 685 people there. <clears throat> and none of us really had any faith at that time in the principles. Uh, were non-existent, and there was no basic text. How does a guy like me affect a change, ladies and gentlemen? After spending a lifetime getting high, if you came up to me then, I was very cynical and very skeptical about everything. I was not only I was bitter about what happened in my life because of drugs. There was no such thing as the message of recovery or the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. I really believe it's a privilege for me to come here and convey to you what has transpired in 11 years of recovery in Narcotics Anonymous for me. This is what I'm going to address tonight. A friend of mine told me, you know, uh, tell it. And I didn't have any morals. My morals were below sea level. You see? And if you came up to me, I would try to take advantage of you because of my desperate situation all the time. You see? There was no such thing as a peaceful afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You see? Everything was racing fear and quiet desperation. And I never heard the message of recovery. In all the places that I've been in, and all the things, and all the exposure that I've had to different uh, types of rehabilitation, and I've been turned uh, incorrigible, and uh, unemployable, and et cetera, et cetera. And I believed all this for all that time, you see. And I walked into Narcotics Anonymous, and my life changed. I owe my allegiance to Narcotics Anonymous. I work for the fellowship, and I'll do anything I can, you see, because I can never repay what was given freely to me. You know what I learned in Wisconsin in 1982? My gratitude speaks when I care and share with others the NA way. That, that was the theme of that convention. My gratitude speaks. And now the journey continues. I'm talking about I'm talking about winning and I was a cold-blooded loser. And I could tell you the story of the loser if you came up to me. I tell you I lost my wife and my daughter, and my dog, and my job, and my car, and my head. Whoa, it's me! <laughs> and there was no message of recovery. No one ever told me about, you know, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, and our lives had become unmanageable. To me, and what was going on then, this was being extremely kind. Because every day was a Lewis and Clark expedition. <laughs> you never know where you were going to end up at night. <laughs> you 
and medicine and religion and psychiatry wasn't the answer, and in desperation we sought help from one another. I'm talking about making it. I'm talking about feeling. I'm talking about embracing. And if you embrace somebody, don't talk about them. Dig that one. When I saw the first step, it made a lot of sense to me. I'm talking about being honest. And we talk about the principles in all our affairs, and I never knew what the principles were. And I'm talking about the second step, and it was the people that were there before me. Crucial identification in the beginning. Caring and sharing the N.A. way, loving, being open, being honest, not having to put up a facade of being a tough guy. I threw, it, I threw the code in the streets out the window and incorporated the 12 steps and the traditions of Narcotics Anonymous in my life, and I'll tell you right now, I'm feeling good. <laughs> and I can't be just more enthusiastic about what's happened to me in my life. And I'm going to explain. It might take some time. <laughs> Bear with me. I love you for the dues that you paid. I love you for the people that you are. I love you for having the courage and the tenacity to face life on life's terms and not pick it up. And after 11 years of recovery, my life didn't turn out, you know, it's not going the way I wanted it to be, but I'll tell you something, I feel fortunate. Because I'm embraced by the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. Never underestimate the power of the fellowship! And I had no God of my understanding because I, I was a survivor of Catholic school. I remember right early on, my eighth grade nun, Sister Emmeline, used to look at me and say, You! <laughs> you insignificant piece of humanity born on the bridge of ignorance! <laughs> I said, Oh my God, I must be really messed up! And I drifted away from the church, and I always thought it was going to be a fire and brimstone God that was going to come down and persecute me for all the things that I was doing. The use and abuse of drugs. You see, I never believed you could stop using. And I walked into that meeting, and there was a guy there, and he was saying, If you don't believe, you believe that I believe enough for all of us. And in the beginning, it was honesty, and then hope came into it. And I said, could it possibly happen for me, a dreamer? I spend a lifetime dreaming, dreaming of the day. If I could only stop using, I would tell myself. If I could only stop using. If I could, I went in there and they asked me, what do you want? And I said, one day. You see, and I believe that was impossible for me because I was... Well, I was running a lot at that time, and nobody was chasing me. <laughs> it must have been the cocaine. <laughs> well, they, although they said it wasn't, you know, physically addictive, it didn't create physical withdrawal, just a little psychological discomfort. <laughs> you just feel like killing yourself. <laughs> See? So I was running cross town. I was going running from the east side to the west side to the east side to the west side, and there was nobody chasing me. 
And my friend, the gangster, told me, for God's sake, Tony, before you start running, make sure somebody's chasing you. It makes more sense that way, Tony. Because I was paranoid, I thought the CIA was out there and the Department of Motor Vehicles and the FBI and the RMV and they're all out there taking names. See. Now remember the three of us, there were three of us, uh, me and these two other unfortunates. I say that because they never heard the message of recovery. They're not here today. They're gone. And there we were, we were holed up in a motel room over there in the Bronx. We were gonna, we were gonna party hardy. And we walked in there with two ounces of cocaine. See? And, and, why well, had a friend of mine that when he got loaded, he didn't get paranoid, he got mellow. So the rest of us got the fear. And he was leaning up, and I was wondering where one of my friends was under the table, and I was yelling, Come on out! There's no police! It's okay! Come on out! And he had a Marlboro filter in his mouth. And I was hiding, I, I was hiding, peeking out the drapes. And the third dude was leaning up against the wall saying, Call me Mellow Yellow. <laughs> we had to call somebody to get us out of that room. Because we swore they were out there. And somebody said something about courage being a state of mind that enabled you to confront your fears. I got all kind of fears, you see. And then I talked about, uh, began to write my, uh, my story down. I, he told me, write about it. Write about what you're powerless over. Write about, about, you know, how you came to believe. Write about what unmanageability was. Write about insanity. You can do that. That's easy for you. <laughs> and I ask God for, for the courage and the strength to be totally honest. Because this honesty thing became a way of life with me. I'm talking about the philosophy of recovery. I'm talking about a set of values of Narcotics Anonymous by which a guy like me came to believe and live by. And as a result, my life changed. You know, in New York, we got a, uh, we're on a committee that helps the World Service Conference because we feel that we want to help out. And being that we're not really in serving world service, we're, we've got this committee and we put on these theaters and we help out. And we've got a philosophy on this committee. It's about give, every, give everything away. The freedom of giving! And our lives became enriched because of the fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. And I wrote my story. And I felt, I felt sorry for, for the guy in the story. It was me. You know, because I began to remember all the things that happened to me and reflect back on my life on, on, on what transpired and lost loves and, and uh, all these feelings of frustration and anxiety and t losing and tension and, and, and stress, if you will. And that's all putting it mildly. <laughs> I, I came to the conclusion after I began recovering that I was under a severe anxiety attack for about 25 years. Because <laughs> <laughs> my friend asked me after 25 years of use and he said to me, do you think we got a problem with this stuff? I said, I, it looks that way. <laughs> because
Because one was too many and a thousand was never enough. So I began uh, writing and then I began and then I, I told another human being the exact nature of my, of my wrongs as I, as I perceived them. And uh, I began to look at character defects and I began to work on character defects because I didn't want to be, be the kind of guy that I was before. And Narcotics Anonymous gave me the opportunity to come out of myself and be there for other people. Okay? And I feel good about giving. And I think true anonymity is doing something for someone and expecting nothing, okay, just what you get out of it. And through Narcotics Anonymous, I was able to help my folks. I was able to be reunited with my daughter. I was able to feel worthwhile, a feeling of worth. I'm talking about the steps of Narcotics Anonymous. And then I began to zero in on my character defects in the sixth step. And the principle was willingness, and I was willing to do this. And I began to feel better. I swear, I can tell I haven't had a bad day since I stopped using. Yeah. You know, I, I remember, I look back at, at my addiction, and I look back at being lonely and uh, I always wanted to touch and I always wanted to be in love and I'm talking about the house with the bay window <laughs> and this is where it's at and I in in my recovery my life has twisted and turned and twisted and turned but I got to say I can report tonight that it was up to now, beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> you know the theme of the New York Convention, WCNA 13, and I'm a loyal convention person, was the impossible dream. Yeah. And the impossible dream was you could never stop using, but you dreamt of the day that just maybe you might. And we walked in that, in, in, to, we came to Milwaukee that afternoon, and we had about six or seven meetings in the city, and now there's a couple of, uh, a couple of thousand. I'm talking about other people coming in. I'm talking about the more you give, the more you get. I'm talking about the philosophy of recovery. I'm talking about the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. I'm talking about the principles behind the traditions, things like unity and equality. You know, I work in the field, and you know what I tell the people? My clients, whom I love, by the way, they ask me what I love, what was the best thing about the job? You know what I told them? I told them it's the clients, the people. And a lot of them have never heard of Narcotics Anonymous. You know what I tell them? We've got no business being prejudiced against one another for any reason. I'm talking about the very tradition. about maintaining it's about go it's about equality it's about anonymity it's about freedom it's about restitution it's about spirituality it's about service it's about brotherly love it's about sharing and for a guy like me to be able to come up here and talk about these things is truly a miracle <laughs> In Chicago, it was miracles happen, okay? And we went on, and the journey continues in London. And then we went to London, and then we went to, to, to New Orleans, and on and on. And each time, was a, each experience was more and more, became in, more enriched with the people that came into your life, my life, the people that were working uh, at the time. I'm talking about making it. I'm talking about winning. I'm talking about having. I'm talking about feeling. I'm talking about sharing. I'm talking about embracing. I'm talking about Narcotics Anonymous. Yeah. 
And I've been on in Synanon and on the methadone program and I tried acupuncture. I remember one time I got out of jail and I was walking cross town with the best of intentions. <laughs> I really was. I was tired of going to jail. I was tired of getting busted. I was tired of stealing and being dishonest. I really was. I was 20 years old at the time. And I saw it written on a wall. There was a sign on a wall that said, you can stop using drugs. I said, wow. I breathed right in. It was an acupuncture clinic. I'm not knocking it. <laughs> I was so willing and open. I was so tired of watching my friends who weren't using, making it, and going on dates, and driving nice cars, and keeping nice jobs, and wearing nice clothes, and there I was scuffling around. You see, in the middle of the night, I was like one of them vampires I used to get up at night. I couldn't take the light. It must have been the cocaine. So I breezed in and there was this doctor, he must have came from Tibet, Dr. Wong. And he said, do you use drugs? I said, yes. He said, well, I'm going to insert these two pins in your ears and they have little plastic knobs at the end. When the obsession, when the obsession comes on you and the, imp uh, and the compulsion to you is, I want you to just turn these little pieces of plastic at the end of these pins that are inserted into your earlobe. And you'll find the obsession and the compulsion will immediately leave. I said, far out. <laughs> I'm ready. I said in my, I, I extended my earlobe. And he put him in. And I walked out, figured I'm okay now. All I got to do is just turn these little knobs when, when I get that feeling. So I breezed down, and of course I walked, I walked by the scene, and I got, all of a sudden I was overcome by obsession. I looked into the mirror. There was a mirror there, like, and I, I looked, and I looked ridiculous. I look like my favorite Martian. <laughs> so I was in the grip of obsession. And I was about to be compelled. So I started turning these dials. connection and he had he was a little paranoid he had about 20 locks on his door <laughs> took about 45 minutes to get in <laughs> first he used to peek through the peak hole and then he started opening these locks and then the bars and it was like a like a cell in there and he said tell me where you been man what have you been doing? I said, oh, I just tried this acupuncture. It didn't work. He was my idol. He always had the stuff. Of course, he got evicted in the end. We won't talk about him. And there was no message of recovery at the time, and I went on and on for another 20 years using... And it took me to places I didn't, I, I didn't want to go, and it made me do things I didn't want to do. 
you see? And I never wanted to hurt anybody, okay? But in the course of my addiction, I found myself in all kinds of horrendous situations. And then I found myself older, more bitter, and I no longer wanted to, I not only wanted to, it wasn't even about not using, it was about not living anymore. Because I felt like I shot past the money. I felt like I was at the airport when my boat came in. <laughs> so in my life, that's what I was telling them, woe is me, you see. I walked into a Narcotics Anonymous meeting and my life changed. I walked into Narcotics Anonymous and the philosophy of recovery began to unravel for me. I walked into Narcotics Anonymous and I stopped using. And I was not only was on, you know, all my life I was on the outside looking in. You know, I used to pass, I'll be honest, I used to pass restaurants and see people out there having candlelight dinners down 2nd Avenue, I'd be out there, and I have a couple of hundred in my pocket, but I couldn't have nothing to eat because I went down and had to, and had to spend it all on drugs, see? And I said, man, if I could only do that, and I was never able to do that until I walked into Narcotics Anonymous and I began to learn how to live my life without using drugs, and for this, I am eternally grateful. I became willing to deal with the defects of character and it was explained to me that shortcomings were things that you act out in recovery and I had a couple of shortcomings <laughs> ah! Of course, we all have our sordid various perversions, but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I begin to work on them, and I begin to uh, take a look at them, and I begin to realize, and I begin to learn about what's happening, and I begin to feel better about myself, and I begin to uh, develop an inner calm and a peace that comes through working the steps of Narcotics Anonymous. Through living, not only, not only talking to talk, we're great at talking to talk, I'm talking about walking the walk. Today I was older and lonely and using when you're 20 and using when you're 40 is different. You know, I was at a guess. <laughs> you see, I really was. I was tired. And I walked into a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, a non-believer, and somebody said, If you don't pick it up, you won't get stoned. <laughs> and I said, Run that by me again. <laughs> you mean if I don't pick it up, I won't get stoned? Why? That makes sense. <laughs> Where was I all those years? I must have been perplexed by the profundities of the universe. Elementary Dr. Watson. <laughs> How incredibly profound. <laughs> so I made a list of the people that I've harmed in my life and a lot of them were gone and I had to do things and to try to make amends. And then I made some direct amends to the people wherever possible. And sometimes I, I do H&I and, 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 and I commemorate that for somebody that I can't reach. And sometimes I give stuff away and I tell myself it's kind of a ninth step because you can't reach the people that you really harm because they're not here anymore. Okay? And I feel better about it. And I feel good in giving. And when I'm wrong, so most of the time I promptly admit it. You see, I'm talking about forgiveness of oneself, 
to give, forgive one, uh, somebody else, and then to forgive yourself. I'm talking about a conscious contact with God, the, the God of your understanding. And I began to, to feel, I began to come into recovery, I began to come into program. In the beginning, we never even used the word program because we were on the methadone program. It was like kind of a, you know, hell methadonians! <laughs> Get up off methadonia! <laughs> so we shied away from that. I'm talking about total enslavement. That was, that was uh, you know, the purveyors of zombieism. You too can be a zombie. I was, uh, that took 10 years, by the way. Of course, I couldn't use heroin. So I... With a thing that would take away the euphoric effect of heroin. How malicious and devious. <laughs> They must have been up to the staying up uh, uh, overtime. They must have been working overtime on this. Somebody said, well, Tony, there's always cocaine. <laughs> Somebody said, well, why do you use so much cocaine, Tony? I said, well, uh, it, in it intensifies my personality, quite obviously. <laughs> He said, does it? What if you're an asshole? <laughs> so after he said that, I stopped saying that, and I said, well, it intensifies my hearing. <laughs> so then I got so that I could hear you lick a stamp <laughs> in the next room. I can hear you giving me a finger. <laughs> but it was not addictive. <laughs> you didn't get any physical withdrawal from it. Now, I work in the field and they have bazooka smokers and magic carpet flyers and dragon chases and slam dunkers and jet rockers and mega blasters and 31 flavors I'm talking about. Sounds insane. I even told them, you know what? I, I addressed the group. I said, you know what? In, I'm sure in 1997 or something like that, they're going to come out with some rock suppositories. <laughs> well, you can stick them up your ass, you don't have to take the stairs, go right up into the second floor. <laughs> I'm in a window. Honey, I'm home. <laughs> Here I come to save the day. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter uh, what manifestation or what form it takes, what brand of insanity. I'm talking about the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. I'm talking about the philosophy of recovery. I'm talking about that one addict helping another is without parallel. I'm talking about feeling good. I'm talking about being in love. I'm talking about being in position. I'm talking about life could be really okay. I learned that in Narcotics Anonymous. I came in, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know where I was all that time. I, I've been in all these places and, uh, like, when I was on methadone, I, I, I had a problem with heroin. 
And then I got on methadone. And then I had a problem taking a shit. The head doctor of the program said, listen, doc, I'm married. I was married at the time, and my wife and I, we've been on the meds for eight months now, and, uh, and gee, we see, can't seem to get, get together sexually. There seems to be no sex life. We seem to be, you know, inactive, <laughs> which is unusual. Could it be the methadone? He said, no, no, no. Go to a hotel, a motel, and uh, get yourself a room and have the FM music piped in and let nature take its course and you'll find everything will work out. And that's what we did. We went up uh, I-95 to Mystic Seaport, Connecticut and checked into this nice little motel and the FM music was coming in and, you know, and the next thing you know, uh, we went to sleep. And when we woke up, the mattress was on fire. <laughs> and the place was burning down. There was smoke in the room. And the firemen rushed in and beat the mattress to death. And the manager said, please leave. You're burning the place up. And we went back to the doctor and said, God, we burned the motel down, doctor. <laughs> Could it be the meth? He says, no, take some Metamucil ta suppositories. Try them. I look back and I look back at the exposure that I had to different brands of recovery, if you will, or different methods or different techniques. And I tell myself I wanted to stop using, but I didn't know how. And I walked into Narcotics Anonymous and I learned how to live. And I learned how to give. You know, I'm not, I'm not the success that I'd really like to be, okay? But I'm not the failure I thought I was. It's always an honor and a privilege to come. And you know, when they said to me, come up to, to Wisconsin, I remember, I remember Milwaukee. I remember the Hyatt. I remember the people I met. The people that I met then are still in my life. The people that I met then took the time to help, to guide, to be there for me, okay? To teach me, if you will. Each one, teach one. And you know what? Uh, as a result, I became, I, I began to develop into the human being that I always should have been before I short-circuited my emotional capacity to feel by the use and abuse of drugs. And when I'm in self-deception, I realize I can't get out of self-deception myself. It would take another addict to get me out and bring me to reality because I have a way of getting carried away with myself, okay? Tell it, now, uh, right now I would say, my life is going okay, but it's not what I thought it would be, all right? I'm one of those incurable romantics, if you will. I remember one time I was very lonely, and I went up to a place up in Westchester County called Lucius Society of Singles. I was on a lamb, I was hiding, in fact, a couple of people wanted to kill me. I wonder why. And I was scared, terrified. I was sleeping with a gun. And people used to come in. Uh, the few people that knew where I was used to come in and say, oh, what a beautiful gun that is. And I used to say, I hate sleeping with a gun. I'd rather sleep with a gal. And I went to this, and I picked up the newspaper one day out of total desperation. I breezed into Lucia's Society of Singles, and I met a very attractive, very independent, very beautiful young, young lady. And I said, how about dinner next Saturday night? And she said, fine. And I went and I, uh, I, uh, 
called up the, the, this restaurant on, on, the, on the water. It was called Lucky Lil's. And I said, how about a table for two with a harbor view? And uh, I got reservations. And all that week, I was all a flutter. Lonely as I was, I was desperately lonely because of the life that I was leading. No one was around. I had no one to impress. Okay? I was dying inside. So I waited for that Saturday night, and that Saturday night came, and of course I got, a, I shot up two speed balls, and I had about 12 gin fizzes without the fizz. <laughs> I smoked a few reefers, and then my nephew breezed in and said, Uncle Tony, I got a couple of these mescaline barrels for you. Put them under your tongue. Don't let them get on the enamel of your teeth. They'll rot your teeth out. <laughs> so I said, that's my boy! And off I went. And I rang the bell. But by the time I rang the bell, I, I was going up, down. I felt a little, you know, a little high. <laughs> so we breeze over to Lucky Lil's and they're playing Mozart, but to me it sounds like Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. <laughs> then I noticed the lights were intense. Then they gave us the menus and I was trying to read the menu, but the proof kept jumping off the menu. <laughs> then stuff was moving on the table, and then I saw the raisins coming. They were... Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> then I collapsed in a minestrone soup, you know, and I had all macaroni and stuff all over my... Suit and the gal got up and said, I'm leaving, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and I said, of course you're going, I'm a piece of shit. That's what I thought of myself. Okay, I had no self-esteem, never mind low self-esteem. And then I went down and, and to the scene. And my man told me, where you been? You got soup all over you. <laughs> I said, well, I went on this date. That was my frame of reference. You see? That's what I needed to show up. And I came into Narcotics Anonymous and I found out, you know, if you don't do it in recovery, you haven't done it. I feel like I'm making it tonight. I really do. I feel good most of the time, believe it or not. This is what I tell people, and I really feel it, no matter what happens in my life. We talk about relationships. That was a hard one for me, too, but I really have to say that I've learned that it takes time to develop and be able to come out of yourself and be there for another human being without being immature and uh, self-centered and, and I, I, me, me, and all that, you know. And uh, I've had my... I've had my pain, is the word, <laughs> that comes to mind. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, they, no, you know, I had my friend, no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. I said, please don't say that again. <laughs> no pain, no gain. I said, ah, oh, man, I just... I come out of a relationship. I was in a relationship for nine years, and uh, it, it just disintegrated in, in front of me, you know. And uh, my friend said, "No pain, no gain." It bees that way. It bees that way. I said, "Please shut up." And I asked him, well, how come you're not, how come you're not emotionally distraught at the, at the loss? I was. But I said to myself, well, Tony, you've been clean for 10 years. How are you going to act? You're going to stand up here. It's not about an excuse to run out, you see. When you, when you use, you lose. And 
Sometimes we get high and sometimes we die. And I have friends of mine in New York City who are afflicted with the virus and they ain't using. And their lives have become so much better in Narcotics Anonymous no matter what's going on. And they got problems that don't have solutions and they're not using. I'm talking about a profile in courage. I've got a friend of mine right up here in, in Michigan, and his name is Bruce. I love the man. The man's one of my heroes. just want to mention him because he's dear, because he's confronting his fears, and he's not using. And he can get whatever he wants, I would imagine. And my friends in New York City could get whatever they want, and they're not using. They choose to, they choose to stay in recovery. I'm talking about against all odds. I went to a wedding a couple of, about a month ago, and I, I was. And none of them are using. I don't know about a message of recovery like that. We can't have no more of a profound uh, message than that. I'm talking about it works. I'm talking about making it. I'm talking about winning. And I know you know what I'm talking about. How does a guy like me affect the change? By working the steps in Narcotics Anonymous. By, you know, in the beginning we used to mention practice the principles in all your affairs. No one knew what the principles were. <laughs> practice the principles in all your affairs. Then we used to stand in the back of the room and talk about everybody. <laughs> practice the principles in all your affairs. And then we all began being eaten up by petty rivalries and all of that. Wait up for the petty rivalries. Nobody knows who's going to be here tomorrow. We've got no time for that. That's what I tell the people. Now, I've got no time to listen to that. You see? <laughs> began to find out about honesty and surrender and hope and faith and courage and willingness and humility and perseverance and forgiveness and restitution and spirituality and service and brotherly love and equality and unity and freedom and anonymity and common sense. You see? And all of a sudden, it became easier to comprehend the philosophy of recovery. And as I got into the, the comprehension of the philosophy of recovery, I began, one, to get an inner peace and a calm about myself. Two, to maintain my composure. Three, my perception of reality seems to be much better than it was. I'm not lying to myself no more about things. I'm beginning to really experience living in, in, on life's terms and most of the time enjoying myself about it. Of course, I'm a member in good standing of Narcotics Anonymous. I'm talking about the key that turns the lock to the door of your life, and you open the door and you feel the warmth come in, okay? I'm talking about the absence of fear. I'm talking about the absence of animosity. You know what I said to, to Hal before? I said, you know what? What I experienced in this room tonight, right? Genuine, mutual affection. 
Okay? And I truly go away with a lot more than I came with. And I truly am one of your fans. And if you tell me that you're making it, it tells me that I can make it. And making it to me is not using. You know, they said, what is winning? Somebody said, what is winning, Tony? For a guy like me, winning is not using. I have to say this. It's a privilege to come, come here to Wisconsin yeah. to address a group of your caliber, a group of people that are living a day at a time without using drugs and continue to do it no matter what is the obstacles or what you're confronted with. To me, this draws true admiration and respect. I love you. In conclusion, in conclusion, I, I just want to say that this has been a grand weekend for me to come up here. It's been very restful, and, and I'm going to take back a lot more than I came with, okay? And I feel touched, and I feel, I feel good. And I love you.